Good evening, one and all, and welcome to tonight's episode of The Author's Outpost. This is 17 episodes deep. I can't believe it's actually been going on that long. It just sure felt like I just started doing this not that long ago. Carol, you are muted, by the way. I can see your little symbol. Um, I would like everyone to thank you for joining this evening. We are live here on YouTube. We are live on Twitter as well, if you are so inclined. Uh, we are also simul streaming on Rumble. If you could give, do us a favor, go over to the Rumble. Give us a little bit of a uh, algorithm boost over there. Smash that little uh, thumbs up button. Drop a little comment. Try and help us get up there because we're trying to build over on that new tech site. And for anyone who's watching, we are also live over on Caro's YouTube channel. Get that content and get it going. Thank you to everyone who is here. And my guest this evening is an independently published author, someone who has written uh, some, how, did it, how was it described? Uh, oh, urban fantasy and yeah. a little bit of romance as well as uh, you know a few other uh bits of work here and there, as well as a member of the much acclaimed and much talked about these days, Ripaverse team over in the indie comic scene. So we're kind of touching on two little communities here in the indie novels, the indie comics, and anything I could do to bring both those communities together in some way is always going to be a win in my point. Uh, Carol, thank you for joining me this evening. Oh, no, thank you for inviting me. I was so thrilled. Um, you were doing like a stream where it was like open door. And I was like, oh man, any other day I would be there. And I told you, and you're like, well, just come on in. I was like, oh. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not terribly walled off from anybody. Most of the time, most of my guests are like right place, right time. Or other people are like, Hey, you want to come on my show? And like, yeah, why not? And if I could, you know, time is uh, no factor before we get started, I'm going to roll to see how the live stream goes a bit of a, a bit of a tradition here. And because it's the beginning of October, we're in the middle of spooky month. I got an appropriate dice. Now, this it's a little hard to see, but there's a little bit of Halloween dice that I got. It's got a little pumpkin on the D20 spot. And we're going to see how this uh, how spooky month treats us. No fudge in the dice. Not on my table. That's a 10. Perfectly average, just like me. We're gonna, uh, Before we get started, we're going to go and we're going to say hello to the chat and see who's here. Because without the chat, I don't got nothing. And I thank everybody from the Iron Age and elsewhere for dropping in. I'm going to say hello to Hail the Lord. Good to see you. Carol Brown, who is double dipping. Yes, me. Ultimate Kahuna, who is here over from the Iron Age. Mr. Christopher D. Brand, thank you for jumping in. John, yes, this is a simulcast. We are, uh, and like Carol said, I did say it was okay. I'm very happy for anybody to, you know, simul stream. You know, feel free to take advantage of my monthly StreamYard subscription. Trippy Saul, good to see you. AC Pritchard, good to see you as well. I'm Abomination AJ, what up, people? Cool Gamer, thank you for dropping in. Mr. My, uh, author Michael F. Kane, good to see you this evening, sir. Tony Capone, Tony Capone Tomic Comics, what's up, guys? What's up? We're about to have a good show. Herman, author Herman P. Hunter, the apostate has arrived. Ha, I get that reference. Katie from Periopsis Press. Waves at us. Good to see you, Katie. Controversial Opinion says, hey, good to see you two here. I don't know how in the world to pronounce that. Eh? Echos Kovacs? You have a name. I'm going to call you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call you. Uh, I'm going to call you AK. And Brandon698, thank you for dropping in. This is somebody you know I take it. That's Brandon. He's the warehouse manager. Oh, Brandon. I, Brandon, good to see you, man. He did and this amazing I, video about how to assemble the short box. I passed him up, I passed him up earlier because your avatars look very similar. Caffeinated Wolf, good to see you. A fellow Xenoblade uh, Chronicles fan. Always, always happy to have uh, one of those. And Kane Walker just dropped in. Thank you guys for showing up. Much appreciated. And hail the Lord doing the mod thing. Thank you for showing up, sir. So, Carol, mm -hmm. welcome to the Author's Outpost. Thank you for coming in today. Like I said, um... I like to bring all my authors back to the beginning. Tell me about where the process, where, where did the journey to become an author start with you? Oh, um, I guess the first thing I ever wrote was something for a book report. Um, I wrote this, uh, I read this, uh, I guess, middle grade novel at the time. And I got so upset with the book that in the middle of class, when I finished reading it, like I just kind of like threw it on my desk and, you know, my teacher walked over. She's like, is there a problem? I was like, yeah, the ending of this book is garbage, right? 
Um, and she's like, well, what's wrong with it? So I, I explained it to her and she's like, you know what, for your report, if you want to write, you know, five to 10 pages of a, of a different ending, you know, I'll take that. And I was like, bet, right. I'm allowed to say that Brandon said I could say it now. Um, and so that's, that's pretty much where it started. Um, and then as I grew older and I got more into books and reading them, I always enjoyed writing. Uh, but I'll never forget this. I had a teacher who told me to find a, another job at the same time because she's like, you won't be able to make yourself a living as an author, so you'll have to go find something else. And uh, trying to figure out what I wanted to do as an adult outside of writing has, has continued to be an ongoing process. So I'm still working on that. I, I That's the thing about those uh, school guidance counselors. Hello, Royce. Good to see you. Awesome to see us both on stream. I agree. I agree. Um I remember when I was when I was younger in the school guidance counselors, they were always proposing, you know, like the most mundane jobs, you know, oh, you can yeah, you could be an accountant, uh, you could be a tra tradesman. And they never said, like, you know, you could probably be a pro wrestler. You know, you could you could probably go and write comic books. You know, they never had f good fun jobs. It was always boring, stable, you know, white collar work. And I never particularly. uh uh, felt inclined towards a lot of what they suggested that that's just me. So. Sorry, I'm trying to like do some minor tech support with this mic. I have a new one coming tomorrow for anybody who is asking. Okay. Um, this one is complete trash and this is unfortunately the only one I have to work with. So I do apologize for the fading in and out. So. Oh, that's fine. I was telling every, I was telling Carol before the stream started, my headphones going out too. I can only hear out of this speaker and in the wires in a position where if I move at, at all, it might stop working and I can't hear anything. So that would be most unfortunate. Mm -hmm. So you started, you, you decided to kind of throw that uh, advice away and just start writing on your own. I was always a writer. Um, I mean, when I wasn't doing it professionally, uh, I was actually just doing a whole bunch of fan fiction. So, like, you know, Dragon Ball Z, Inuyasha, all, all the all the, the cool anime, right? Like when I was growing up in the uh, 1990s and the early 2000s. And, uh, you know, I never really did anything big with it. But uh, what happened was I didn't really take it super seriously until I was older. Um, in 2018 is uh, when I decided I was going to write a book and try and get it published. And I actually did get it published through an indie house for a little while and I ended up getting it back. But the moment that I got the acceptance letter from like the publisher was kind of like my, my uh, validation that this was something that I could do. And what I needed to do was just keep working on that skill and keep honing it. And so I've done lots of different writing experiments and played with like kind of different genres and stuff like that to see where my my thing for that is but it's i mean just like anything else it's never you never stop learning you never stop trying to be better at it i mean because every time i've met somebody who says that they're kind of like at the peak of their game i'm like but you know there's still more to do right like yeah there's yeah. there's always room for improvement with especially when it comes to that um and i i found this i found this interesting um I wasn't big on the fan fiction, but I did write, uh, for those who don't know, uh, fanfiction.net, like the, the site for fan fiction, they have a sister site called fictionpress.org. And that was where I wrote a lot of stories. And it's essentially the same format, but instead of for fan fiction, it's for original works, right? So essentially that's where I was putting a lot of stuff. And that can be get you kind of... Uh, it's it's the same format, it's the same series of reviews, and that kind of, uh, I almost feel stunted my growth as an author for a while because I was writing stuff chapter by chapter, you know, hoping somebody would see it and, you know, comment on it, review it and like it. And, uh, you, you develop like a small little micro following if your stuff, you're frequently, uh, uh, you're frequently posting enough, but I always felt that it teaches you the wrong, uh, so a lot of the wrong lessons when it comes to, you know, growing as a writer, because if you make, if you're just hobby writing, that's all, all well and good. If you're trying to make the transition to, uh, okay, I'm cutting my teeth on this so I can learn how to be a novel writer. It's, it's the wrong way to write a novel. That's, that's, that is not a great way to learn how to write a novel using that fan fiction and fiction press, uh, format from my perspective at the very least. Yeah. Same thing with, um, with Wattpad as well. Cause they both encourage like regular posting, and all of that. And it's one of those things that if you want to do that kind of release, that rapid release, because that's really what it is, you kind of need to do it ahead of time. And I had one story with another fanfic, right? Everybody's surprised. 
Um, but I had another story that I did. And my goal was just to basically do a chapter a day. And I did it. It's not my best writing, but I did it. And uh, one of the things that it taught me was that I'm not a pantser. I can't pants. Like, I know some people are like really big into the pantsing and can do like everything. And But there were so many days where I was just staring at the cursor going, I don't know what's going to happen right now. Right. Um, but it was it was definitely something that taught me that when you're going to stick to it like that, it has to be something that you absolutely love, right? And I just want to mention that because there's so many uh, books that come out and they're kind of they they do the whole like right to market thing. So it's about writing for a particular demographic and making sure that they're happy. But it's like if that's not you know a genre that you really want to write, then you know why would you make yourself write it kind of thing? Yeah, and there's a. There's a slight bit of truth that there are some people who are some authors who are very much, OK, this is what the market is hot on right now. And they put something out there, especially when uh, you've got some indie authors who know how to do that, do it very quickly. And they're able to capitalize on it. Let me look at the proliferation of uh, lit RPG and harem novels like their authors know exactly what their audience wants and they deliver it unfailingly. And, you know, far from I can't I haven't read enough of it to really, you know kind of decide what the appeal is just yet but the audience is there for it and you know if they can manage to do that good on them um i read i think i, I downloaded one one indie harem author's book to kind of see if i could dig what the appeal is and i i actually laughed so i, I laughed so hard because I, I dnf'd it at the moment it starts off the main character is an indie a self-published indie author in his early 30s uh and like the first chapter is him discussing the cover of his next book with another self-published indie <laughs> author in his early 30s I'm like okay there's putting a little of yourself in the book and then there's just being that on the nose you know yeah there's some meta in there yeah a little bit yeah i always Let's liked see. it when authors would write about like other authors and their stories going to like some kind of crime mystery or something like that like <laughs> you're not fooling me i know you just wanted to write self-fiction right right and, and uh, and the thing is, uh, even if you wrote like fan fiction, I was thinking about this the other day uh, with, with fan fiction. You're you're working, you, you know, if you come up with like a great idea for a story, you, you can't do anything with that. It's it's stuck there in that format, basically, you know, you know, because it's somebody else's characters and creations. But if you stop and if you want to like make that jump from fan fiction to a uh, regular novel writer. All you write to me, from my perspective, all you really got to do is take the story, strip down uh, everything that's a licensed IP. What are you left with? You're left with character archetypes. And if you work within character archetypes, then you're on the road to being a, you know, a much more functional author. Mm -hmm. uh, let me say hello to R.H. Snow, who jumped in. Mr. Sean Rowland, good to see you. I salute uh, all I gotta, of you who can pants your stories. I really do. Like it's like witchcraft to me. I respect it. I can't do it. Oh, Sean. Yeah. Anybody who I, can who pants their novels. <laughs> I, I'm a little. I'm a little bit of both, but uh, it, it is what it is. Uh, Daniel from Wimsland thought this shindig kicked off 15 minutes ago. It's kind of did. Uh, we started a little early, but you know, it, it is what it is. We. Uh, you know, I, I, with all my streaming services. Royce from A Drink with Crazy for five. Hail, two individuals who make me realize I have to step up. God bless you both. I'm not going to make any joke uh, goat jokes tonight. Sorry. Oh, well, where's the goat? Oh, no, it's not Wednesday. <laughs> I guess I should be good. Okay. <laughs> That's tomorrow. That's tomorrow. Thank you, Royce. Mm -hmm. So uh, what was the first novel that you published? Uh, the first novel I published was uh, Urban Fantasy, and it was about a man-eating monster that was learning how to make friends and find love. And it was uh, it was kind of the fruit of a discussion that my husband and I had about what would happen to an eternal being after it had like lived for so long, right? Yeah, it's like right, right there, Queen of Swords in Silence. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, my husband was under the impression that it would uh, become a very stoic person who kind of like was just like, you know, doing very well in life. We'll say it that way. Um, but I had the opinion that this would be a very jaded person that was like, you know, it's like, I have the script. I know everything that's going to happen, like blah, 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 blah. Right. Um, and then just for good measure, uh, I made her companion character. It's the sword in there because everybody has to have a magical sword. 
Um, but this sentient sword, because it's a blade, just wants to cut and, and slash into things. So a lot of times whenever she's having conversations, he at some point will bring up like, well, why don't we just cut him? Like, why don't we just slash this away? And uh, she you know, was, there's, a, there's an old saying, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I imagine that applies to swords, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it was, and so the funny thing about, so the sword's name is silence. That's also the the name that's um, carved into the oh, side there. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and he was, you know, one of the, uh, you know, how folks like to ask authors like, you know, who's your author insert in your book. And I'm like, you know, I didn't really do one. So yeah, but everybody does. So which one's you? She's like, you know what? I'm the sword. Okay. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> hey, you, you end up doing that. Sometimes you end up doing that unintentionally. I, and I found this out recently, uh, RH snow and Kitty room both read, uh, are Katie's finished the black crown. I don't know where Miss snow is at, but, uh, uh so they pointed out something. I'm like, you know, this character is basically a nurse that drinks coffee. And I'm like, oh, oh, I did do that. And then another, <laughs> another person was like, hey, you know, your main character is kind of a homeschool boy that reads uh, books. And I'm like, oh, uh oh. And then I started thinking, OK, well, my other main character is a, a guy with too much anger and he likes to punch things. I'm like, uh oh, I think I just split. I think like everybody in the book is just some version of my personality. <laughs> Yeah, I've heard that argument too. That you know, and there, how do I word this? Um, there is some truth to it as well. Because when you create these characters and you like get really invested and you want them to be fleshed out, you are pulling from things that you may have experienced at some point. So there is some part of you that's in them. But you know, don't be like Stephen King who likes to start a whole bunch of his novels like you know an author like in the woods or something like that. So he, he or, has or so many, so many. You know, or I mean, I don't mind. I don't mind King's tendency to uh, always set stuff in Maine. You know, he's kind of doing what he does. I did think it was a bit egregious. Uh, did you read the uh, the Dark Tower? I did. I thought it was hacky as hell. Did, the uh, way my... he inserted, the way he did a self insert in the last book. Oh, you know like, the the thing I didn't really like was um was the part of that last book where he was just kind of like, hey guys, I'm pausing the story to let you know that if you don't want to get really angry, don't read oh, the last oh. pages. <laughs> oh, I hated that. That was the thing about that book that made me cringe the hardest. Like, you're, the author is actually stopping the story. It's like stopping the movie in the middle of watching it for somebody to stroll in and say, hey, if you don't like bad endings, you might want to leave now. Like, what are you doing, dude? Mm-hmm. You're and you were. I could go off like Royce on this topic, and, and believe me that I've got to do a stream of just Dark Tower discussion because it was both the best and the worst of King, from my opinion. Mm -hmm. That was such a stupid thing to write from a writer's point of view. I I can't even believe he did it. I can't believe his editors didn't uh say what are you it didn't stop him. Like there, there had to be a, a reason for that, but I'm going to uh, go ahead. I've got a couple super chats to read real quick. They're coming in uh, hot and heavy. Herman P. Un the, the, Herman P. Hunters, the lower, for lower forge for $10. I'm a major pantser with plotter tendencies. But like I said, some people got to do a little bit of both. I don't think either one is you know right or wrong. Whatever works for the individual writer. My good friend, Abomination AJ, the beast. What is pantsing? Pantsing, AJ, is a writing term. Uh, you have some people who plot, uh, you have plotsers and pantsers. Plotser, plotters are people who plot everything that happens out in their book. Pantsers are called this because they're writing by the seat of their pants. They are trusting that uh, their imagination or their ability to uh, come up with the story on the fly is what's going to carry them through. Some people do one or the other. Some people do a little bit of both. Most I do a little bit of both. So that that is what pants... Uh, what is pantsing? And Timo Berman for two says author time. Indeed it is. Oh, Ultimate Kahuna for one ninety nine. Hold on, I got to do it like he does. Okay. Woo! Rap on, y'all. We got that macho man uh, machismo going on. <laughs> so uh, that was uh, the first one you published. Uh, how long ago was that? Oh, 2019 is when it came out. 2018 is when it was accepted. So... Uh, as everybody may have heard, things take forever to do in publishing. So the moment that my book was accepted, I had to go through the editor and that was, it was terrible. Um, I've actually never had an editing experience quite, quite that, um, 
terrible. Yeah, that's my word. That's the best one because I don't want to be too mean to it, this person. But uh, you went for example, a traditional publisher or or like a. I went through okay. a traditional indie publisher. Yeah. Um, okay. Small house. Yeah. And um, this this editor and I were butting heads a lot, and I don't mean it like in a in like I think Daniel might know because I saw he was in the chat. Um, might know when sometimes authors push back on certain changes and things like that. But this this lady at one point told me that I had to change Queen Titania's name because it started with tit. And I had to ask her <laughs> if she read Shakespeare. And she was like, yeah, I have. Why? It's like, then why am I changing this name? Right. So it was it was things like that. And then I caught her not actually editing part of the book. And yeah, and at one point she sent me a she sent me a threatening email saying like, "Listen, if you don't just accept my changes and do what I tell you to, we're gonna have to delay the book." And I was like, "Okay, cool. Let me talk to your supervisor." You know, went full Karen at that point. But oh gosh, yeah. Uh, when when Karens butt heads, uh, I I was fortunate to have uh, a good experience with my editor, and uh, even if even when she made changes that uh, I didn't. Uh, I didn't necessarily make, I understood why she was like, okay, this change, this change. I'm like, okay, every change really ended up making sense. And uh, I ended up becoming a better writer because of that. Did, did it ultimately get published through that house or did you end no, up? No, no. So that's, um, that's its own episode of Jerry Springer. Cause one of the things that ended up happening is um, obviously there was some infighting about how everything was going. And at one point, like it was, it was so random. I got a release contract. They were like, sign this and get out. And I was like, what is going on? And then like one of the people that worked there sent me a sign on with me. And I was kind of like, can we talk about this? Like, this is happening kind of fast. Um, but it, it was really sad because like this publishing house was up and coming. It was actually really popular a, a, in the indie sphere for a hot minute, but because of bad management that they had on the internal, it just, it crashed really bad. So I ended up being published through another small publisher for a while. And that was okay until uh, she reached out to me and basically said, I want to focus on just romance and you're not writing romance because I wasn't at the time. And I said, you know what? That's fair. Um, so we went our separate ways and I got another publisher at another traditional house. And that one was pretty terrible as well. In fact, I have lots of terrible publishing stories, which is why I am pretty <laughs> indie right now. Um, but I can't really talk a lot about that last one because they had me under a gag order. So I can't really oh, say their God. name or talk about them or anything. Yeah, it's that kind of. That's uh, that's uh, pretty serious. Yeah. I, I guess that's why there's two different covers for uh, Queen of Swords and Silence. Yeah, so the the purple one, that's mine. Um, I actually mm -hmm. paid one of the, the ladies who does the official art for Magic the Gathering for that cover. I, I loved it. It was great. And uh, one of the publishers, I won't say which one because, again, stuff. Um, but they went and did the other one behind my back and just told me to suck it up. So I was like, ah, cool. Thanks. And which one do you like better, though? Mine. Yours? Okay. <laughs> yes. I, I, I got to admit, uh, the other one, and I didn't know this before I, I picked it for the background and for the thumbnail. I got to admit, I, I do like how that other one does look. But, uh, you know, whatever you want, it is your book after all. and. Um, I don't know how uh, things go with a, a trad publisher when it comes to a lot of the uh, uh, a lot of the covers. I would hope there'd be a good communication between them because otherwise you can end up with situations like you remember a few years ago before he passed. Terry Goodkind got into a public uh, Facebook spat um, over the cover of one of his uh, last novels. Mm -hmm. It was perfectly serviceable, but he didn't think it was good enough. And the artist took exception to that and it ended up becoming a bit of a stink between everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, so Ken, he's the guy that did the, the, the teal one. I love that one. I really do. But when we're talking about covers with books, they kind of still have to represent like the genre that you're writing in. Yeah. Right. Um, and unfortunately, the, cause it's right over my head on my screen. Um, this one, while it is gorgeous, doesn't makes it feel like this takes place in a medieval setting. Right. But it's not, it's modern. It's contemporary fantasy. Um, and that was right. kind of. I, I can see how that would, you know, be a bit confusing. And yours is uh, urban fantasy and romance, right? That it, it looks cool. It doesn't exactly scream romance. No, there's there might be like one kiss scene in that oh, thing, but okay. it is it is not romance. No, uh, uh, urban fantasy romance is is very different. Um, and normally, urban fantasy romance, the the romance itself like, takes a, a much bigger plot. 
spotlight, but that that didn't really happen here. So, um, now you've uh, you've got a couple of others that you've done, uh, like Quarantine with My Avatar. Is that a, another book or is that a short story? That was a short story. So I was trying to put together an anthology during 2020 because I was like, what else are we doing right now? Right. So I was like, let's make some quarantine with whatever stories. Right. Um, and so I did Quarantine with My Avatar, which is about like kind of a dystopian gamer girl um, who basically got pulled into like this uh, kind of Eve Online conspiracy thing that was going on. And it was just fun. Like, it was just like a little shameless story. Again, it was, I was just with some people and I was like, hey, let's just go ahead and make like an anthology and, and put it out so that way we can get something nice out of 2020 because it was a rough year, right? It, it was. Yeah. Um, but although, unfortunately, oh, go on. Although, arguably, I, although, arguably for me, I got like, that was when it all started clicking for me when it came to the stories. I was like, oh, I've got the characters in the setting and that's really set off uh, for me. That year kind of came together in a big way. Mm -hmm. but uh, I think a lot of people got their uh, shit straight on certain things when uh, they were kind of forced to you know, mostly be at home for the whole time in yeah. Minecraft. I don't know if this is still verboten on YouTube or not. Uh, discussion. Um, what's your favorite genre to write in? Oh, um, Oh, that's really hard. Um, I really love science fiction. Um, I have one science fiction story. It's called The Persephone that I really loved. Um, I haven't finished writing it yet, but it's it's definitely it, for that. I really like the science in it, like things like The Expanse. Like I love to read that stuff and I wanted to kind of emulate that. But uh, after that, it's going to be the the contemporary urban fantasy kind of stuff, because I really like, mo you know, mythos that we don't believe in anymore, kind of like still being among us. Right. Like that other world kind of secrecy that goes on. And it's always been so interesting to watch other authors take on it as well. It's like there's some like really creative stuff out there that I absolutely love reading. Uh, Moon Called by Patricia Briggs is probably one of my favorite urban fantasy stories. Um, and usually when I say it's like, you know, it's about uh, a coyote who, you know, hangs out with a bunch of werewolves. People hear werewolves and roll their eyes and be like, I can't do it again. It's like, no, you have to read this. It's really good. <laughs> like, it's really, really good. It's a little different. It's it's not like all the other werewolves. And a it's lot of not people like, It's not like it. all those other werewolves. Yeah. I'm different. I swear. Uh, and you might get that. Uh, I think yeah, a lot of people feel that about uh, you know, what they write. Uh, Hail to Iron Age Media, who is showing up. And Cannoli Sasquatch, think, ah, shoot, I said his name right. Doggone it, I should have got my list. I didn't know he was going to be here. I, I, it's a bit of an inside joke. Ever since I ran across this channel, I've been calling him something different every time. Um, and I'm starting to run out of things. I've got to redo the list. I've had a whole list of wrong names to call him every time I popped up in his chat. Uh, controversial opinion is I used to write fan fiction, but what really stops me is doing is my horrible writing skills. Well, you got to work on it, bro. It's and the only thing that's going to get it better is writing more. Made an original story about a girl who sees ghosts, and it was my first story ever. Any advice? Read the stuff that you find really engaging and actually study what it is about that writing that grips you. Like, is it the descriptions? Is it the pacing? Is it the point of view? And in some cases, uh, try and see if you can emulate that. That would be my advice. Uh, I don't know what yours would be, sir. Uh, mine would be to, the if you are at what you consider to be kind of a beginner level, the only thing that is going to get you better at writing and reading is to do plenty of both. Write what you like and some, uh, write what you like, write and read what you like. And in some cases, write and read outside of the genre that you like the most, because you never know what you might pick up. Uh, from a different genre or even which you might be inspired to write in a, shot, a genre that you don't care for. Mm -hmm. Where's it? Okay. Uh, 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 I will give a good example right here. And I've done this plenty of times. My uh, one of my favorite authors of all time, Sarah Douglas was originally, well, first she was a nurse who hated her job and writing novels was going to be her ticket out of it. I sympathize with that very much. And, she originally thought romance novels were the thing it was going to be doing. And she self admits that her first few romance novels that she wrote were terrible. And then she took on fantasy. So she went into fantasy being uh, something of a failed romance author and nailed it. Mm -hmm. And you can see the, uh, you can see the elements of her uh, 
romance writing in here. It starts off with a bit of a YA love triangle of sorts, and uh, but it ends up developing a lot more naturally. She ended up like going backwards and, and kind of cringing that she started that off. But her editors were also kind of like, hey, we kind of need you to keep this character around and, you know, don't... Uh, but a lot of back and forth to kind of settle uh, where those characters were going. So you never know who may, you know, what you may get if you go in and out of your genre, but just write, write plenty and read plenty. The only thing that's going to get you better at writing is to do more writing and lots of it. I would also recommend um, writing groups as well, because a lot of the things that you learn from critiquing other, other works can also reinforce your own writing. So, um, and I'm using an example from, Arizona when I used to live in Arizona and my I think my biggest growth as a writer was when I was looking at everybody else's writing and helping them improvement um, because it also kind of like increases like your your editor eye and you start to pick up on things a lot faster um, that you normally wouldn't because you're just not used to training your brain to look for things like that and as Kate for two dollars is, is this the real Kara or is this Kara LOL. This is Caro. Thank you. Caro. Okay. Yes. We got a Caro and a Cara. Cara, for those who don't know, is Cara Lynn, mm -hmm. who was unceremoniously uh, fired by Limited Edition Games earlier this year for, I don't even think it was something she posted. It was a tweet that she liked. And somebody who politically disagrees with what the, the like that she put told her employers and got her fired. And Eric, July of the Ripperverse, Went ahead and did, uh, you know, stepped up in a big way and offered her a job in his, you know, uh, Ripperverse company. And that was that was a great uh, moment for me, uh, seeing that happen because it was a happy ending for her, and it was nothing but backlash for that company, which a lot of people were very disappointed in that. But it's, it's a good place we can transition to. Um, Carol, you are highly involved in the the new comic book publishing company, The Ripperverse, started by Mr. Eric July. Can you tell us how that happened? Oh, um, okay. Well, let's go back in time a little bit. Um, so, actually, I think this took place in 2017, 2018 as well. Um, I was actually still teaching at the time, and I got into an argument with some teachers about Spider-Man, right? Um, and for me, I always felt like these variations of Spider-Man were kind of washed out um because it was like it, it felt like cheap writing to me and when i made that comment i got feedback along the lines of you know i was a bigot and i wasn't you know really commentary like we've we've seen it on the twitter right and so like it was to the point because and by the way nobody can bully quite like teachers can right and so i remember going home and just being like is it me like am i wrong like am i really no one can like, ignore bullying like teachers can either that's a personal story for another day but i just wanted to get that out there sorry to interrupt you no it's okay i understand um but you know in doing that i actually found um one of eric's videos that he did at the time and it was about how there's too many spider-men i was like oh yes well there are right? yeah and so i you know i watched the video i liked it and at one point i went on to one of his streams and for a while i was just a lurker because you know it, it may not seem like it but i am an introvert and i'm always kind of hesitant to go out into new circles but I left him a donation in one stream saying like, hey, I really like your commentary. I like these things that you're pointing out. Please keep doing it. And he looked right at the camera and said, I will. And he winked. Right. And I was like, oh, man, this guy's smooth. Right. Um, but I became an active member in his community. I helped mod his chats when I could, especially when Nightbot like closed. And I became like his like little personal advertisement to like, you know, have people go buy like his shirts and stuff like that. Um, and then he reached out to me. I think it was in 20... It was in 2021. Um, no, 2020, 2022 or 2021. I can't remember off the top of my head. I should know this. Um, but he said, hey, I'm, I've got some stuff in the works and I need somebody to help me keep this organized. And I know from watching your channel, you're a very organized person. I was like, I would love to help organize things. Right. So I was working more like a contractor um, at that point. So I was going through messages, like helping him put stuff together and, and all of that. And I'll never forget um, the day before we launched ISOM. He was like, hey, can you uh, can you be around tomorrow? And I was like, yeah, what's up? I was because uh, I was working for a game company at that point. Um, he's like, well, I'm going to I'm going to launch the comic tomorrow and I would like you to be around. And I was like, oh, yeah, sure. I hope everything goes well. Right. <laughs> 
And what was funny is that I had told my boss at the time, like, hey, I'm going to take tomorrow off because my my other gig that I've got has asked me to be around. So halfway through that day of, of ISOM number one, he asked me how it was going. So I sent him a, a link and he was kind of like, OK, I'll see you next week. Right. So my boss basically <laughs> told me to not worry about it. Uh, I couldn't get away with that in nursing. And, and uh, you know, I signed up for the shift. I got to work the shift. But uh, I, 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 that would be a strange uh, conversation to have with your boss. Like, OK, you got to take off because you're you're helping a guy launch a comic book, on a YouTuber launch a comic book. Mm-hmm. And uh, honestly, honestly, well, maybe because all my bosses are nurses like uh, th- that wouldn't have cleared it. And they would have been like, well, usually their, their go to is like, if you can get someone to cover your shift, go ahead, you know. <laughs> well, so it's in gaming, right? And right. so like so it's gaming and people usually who are in gaming also know stuff, you know, that's in film and TV and comics and stuff like that. And so my boss actually knew who Eric was. Uh so when I told that's him cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I told him and especially when Eric was making ripples, because I don't know if you're aware of this, but um was it it was DC. Um wait, was it DC? I'm getting them. No, Marvel. Oh my goodness. Um Marvel actually did a comic and they put Eric in it, but they made Eric a troll and they gave it the exact same everything features of Eric um, saying the exact same stuff that Eric said. And then they had She-Hulk beat him up. And I was just like, I can't believe you did that. Right. Um, what? Did yeah. he do a video on this? I don't remember. No, he this. did. He did. It's it's on his channel. Um, but I remember oh. when that came out and I was like, wow, that's I, I wild. may. I may not have been watching him at that point. I'm not sure. Uh, I started picking him up like uh, about two, three years ago, mostly, you know, via I I was I, I caught Ner- Nerbrotic first, and that led me to Geeks and Gamers, World Class Bullshitters, and you know, naturally, it, as and and all them. Naturally, you know, Eric ended up coming in the conversation. The more I ended up watching Eric, the more I you know ended up becoming a fans. And now here I here lately, it's just every video he drops, gotta watch it. And it's just one of those prioritized things. I'd rather watch Eric's videos than watch a new TV show. I don't give a shit about Star Wars, Ahsoka, or any of that. But if Drinker or Internet Historian or Eric drop a video, or Razor Fist especially, stop what I'm doing. Watch the video. Oh, you know, Kane's, it, got, Kane's got the comic right there. He said it was Jane Foster's Thor. Jane that's Foster's Thor? Had. Okay. Yeah. I feel like I, I would have remembered that if I would seen it. So that's how I know I, I haven't seen that. But and, yeah, um, no, I remember when that came out it was wild. <laughs> Hail the Lord. No, 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 I wouldn't do that. I've got a little more self-respect, buddy, but I appreciate the help, you know. Um, but, but yeah, and, so, but yeah. And so like, and one thing I kind of want to kind of put an emphasis on is that I said my boss knew who Eric was, right? Yeah. He's not the only one who knew who Eric was. Like at one point I didn't really talk about Eric in certain circles because, um, Eric was making commentary about things that people just didn't like. And, you know, people in film and TV can be a little sensitive. So there. Uh, yeah, that I don't, especially in my line of work, I don't even bring up that I'm online doing anything. Uh, so nobody goes search. For, I, I don't even like get, I don't even follow people that I work with on like say Facebook or, or anything like that. Like if I'm trying to, you know, take off for a day and they say, oh, they find like some old picture of me at the beach. Like, oh, no, he took off today to go to the beach. Like, I don't need that crap. This is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. So uh, you, you took off the day and that launch was phenomenal. I was watching that go down. I knew he'd make uh, pretty good. I, I figured at least he was probably going to hit a man because there was a lot of enthusiasm at the in anticipation at the time. Did you guys think that it was going to do what was the final number? Four point six million uh 3.7 million is what we closed that the campaign but it did make more and once the campaign was over so yeah it made more and it made more yeah right and and that was phenomenal to see because that just to me proved that not only was Eric's audience enthusiastic but it also proved that the comics reading audience hasn't really gone anywhere they've just shifted their priorities away from the big 2 uh and years of having the harpies behind the scenes at DC and Marvel and IDW, you know, constantly calling the customer base foul things, bigots mm-hmm. and man children. You don't, you don't like the, the barely, uh, the, the barely uh, concealed, you know, feminist propaganda soapbox disguised as cape shit. If you don't mm-hmm. like that, well, you know, 
you're you're just as bad as the bad guys from World War II. Like that line of thinking to me is not just borderline borderline mental retardation. It's it's actually evil in its its own way because. Nobody asked for that. Nobody asked, uh, gets into a hobby and says, boy, I hope the people who make this hate my guts and lecture me yeah. and treat, you know, treat me personally like garbage. And their go-to line is always, well, if you, uh, you're only, if we're calling you a bigot and you're getting mad, that means you're a bigot. No, it's not that you're talking to your audience because only your audience is listening to you. Nobody's listening to you as a, you know, as the, creator behind you know what was it i heard it say that spider-man is the superstar the writer is not the superstar right mm -hmm. that people aren't there because you're you are writing it they're there because they want more spider-man and that a lot of them have let this ego get to their head that because they're the ones in charge of it that popularity is transferred over to them and that's not how it works especially not how it works in corporate comics no. Um, and what happens there? So one thing I usually like to point out when it comes to like the, the traditional house comics is that if you take a look at a whole bunch of the writers that are on staff right now, they're all trust fund babies. And I, I, I say that both nicely and not nicely. But the point that I'm trying to make with that is that they come from a place where trying to make a profit isn't their first priority. Right. Now, I will say Eric was super humble about when he launched ISOM because he just wanted to make back what he put into it, right? Like that was that was his end goal. He ended up like doing more than that. Um, but a lot of these folks, when they they they're I guess you could say that they have the ability to write a story that they feel good about, right? Without having to worry about appealing to the market, so to speak. Um, and that you can always tell when stories are like that because um, people who try to generate something that will sell will will work at it a little differently. There's a, a craft book, if anybody's interested. Uh, it's called Seven Figure Fiction by T. Taylor. Um, I'm, a big, I'm, I'm a big advocate for it. I'm, I'm, I like it a lot. But she's got a thing in there that I thought was really interesting. She said, I'm more willing to spend $8 on my cheap pumpkin spice latte. Keep, keep in mind, she said cheap. Um, than I am to spend on a book on an author that I've never heard of before because at least I know the latte won't suck, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's what a lot of authors are always striving to do. They're always striving to be like, look, I don't suck. Here is some really good work. Like, here's some samples. Like, come check it out. Like, be my friend. Like, you know, and trust fund babies don't always do that, so. <laughs> well, no, they've never, they've never actually risked anything. I wouldn't know what it's like to be a trust fund baby. Uh, my trust fund was the dirt under my feet and, and everything else I've had to uh, build up myself. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrew Campbell wants to ask, where do you get your ideas uh, for your writing process? Yeah. Where, what, what inspires you in your writing uh, to come up with the characters you create? Um, you know, sometimes not to be like, it comes to me, um, but there'll be like a moment where I'll have like a thought or an inkling. Right. Um, and like for this book that I was kind of holding up my cue cards for, this is my outline process, by the way, cue cards. Um, what I did with that was like, I think it would be really cool to write a story about a yarn mancer. So somebody who does magic with yarn. Right. And then I was like, but you know, what could work into that? Like what kind of setting would I put her into and what kind of personality do I want this character to have? And so what I ended up doing was first I kind of like gave her like a skeleton and then I looked at the plot and then I was like, well, what would make this plot kind of engaging at that point? And again, I don't want to write a book that's got like a terrible plot. Right. So I usually put a bit more effort into that before I start looking at characters. Um, but that's, I guess that's where I get my ideas from. Like they come to me and then I focus on them and I polish them and keep going at it. And sometimes I'll run those ideas by my other friends. So like the yarn mancer, I went to a biased audience. I won't lie. I went to a whole bunch of women who did knitting, right? Because that would be my target audience, right? And I was like, hey, what do you guys think about a yarn mancer? And they're like, that would be amazing. And we would all read it. And I'm like, okay, I'll write this book. Okay. <laughs> did that one get written or is, are you working on that? That's actually the book that I wrote in the last seven uh, seven day book challenge. So I had seven days to write an entire novel. So during that week, I wrote uh, fifty five thousand words of that novel, and I'm in the process of editing it right now. So I'm hoping to have it completed on my part at least by the end of November. 
and then I get to go and find uh, another editor to work with uh, because uh, my my eyes, while they are good when it comes to my work, I'd like somebody else to look at it as well. So, yeah, uh, that's uh, no matter how how much I like to feel, I've caught everything. Like I, it took four passes to get the Black Crown uh, into what I felt was like as smooth as it possibly could be, and I had beta readers pointing out. Um, I beta readers that were pointing out mistakes and uh, a friend who was pointing out this, that, and the other. And my, my final polish pass, which I, which was a bit of a drudge. I ain't going to lie uh, going through it. Cause I've read this book so many times now I've reached that point where you're tired of reading your book. Uh, this is about as polished as it possibly can be. And it is in the hands of my formatter. So uh, hoping to have some good info on that, but. Okay. I mean, that sound that does sound interesting. It's, it's a yarn mancer. It sounds like something you would kind of see in a, a bit of a cozy fantasy, a reader or cozy fantasy. Have you seen any of those? I have. Uh, um, yeah, there's a, I mean, there's all kinds of things out there. Uh, I ended up reading cozy fantasies because one of my friends wrote cozy mysteries and she would send me stuff to read. And at that time I didn't really read cozy mysteries. So my idea of, did you hear editor? Yes, you did. Um, <laughs> I knew and, he was going to do it too. Um, and, um, because I didn't read that genre when I was reading her work and I was giving her feedback, it was actually away from that particular, um, demographic. So what she did was because she knows I like fantasy stuff is that she found a whole bunch of like cozy fantasy mysteries and sent those to me to read. And so I, I think I read about six of them. And then once I did that, I understood like the beats and how things worked and the expectations and all of that. So, and that's also something I would recommend. Like if you're going to, like, I've run into people who will write something, but they don't read it. And uh, there was one guy who I was doing, um, who I was doing some beta reading for. And at one point I was like, do you, do you read this, this fantasy genre like at all? And he was like, no, I don't have time to read it. I was like, why are you writing it? Like, he's like, well, I just wanted to write it. And so I tried to explain to him about how some of the stuff that he was putting into his book were... Um, the types of tropes and cliches that were very not popular. And, um, you know, he's like, well, no, people are going to love it. My book is going to change hearts and minds. And once you hear that line from authors, you're like, okay, cool. Nice font. Nice, nice pacing. Here you go. Right. <laughs> Have a nice day. Can, can you uh, kind of uh, put into words, what's the appeal of the cozy fans? Cause I haven't delved into it yet. And I've got my eye on like at least one that. Oh, like come uh, out. the cozy. The cozies, um, so the cozies are kind of like a light uh, whodunit, right? Um, there's no violence. There's nothing like super graphical, but there's a mystery and somehow your main character is involved and they're just trying to figure out what's going on and they're going to get to the bottom of it. And, you know, those pesky kids, man, they were the ones that did it. <laughs> but it's it's very lighthearted. It's not. Uh, and the reason my friend wanted me to read them was because I can get really detailed with like certain scenes. Um, and verbiage and stuff like that and um, cozies don't do that like cozy cozies are written are read by like old ladies who just want to like enjoy like a couple hours so i i can see that it's it's definitely a genre that started to pick up uh and you really really catch its own audience you know that, that there that little bits of slice of life stuff mm -hmm. uh, stuff that was really popular in uh, web comics in the early 2000, the early 2010s. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's where a lot of that comes from. And, and there's still some web comics that do that. And I've always found that those were all about that slice of life connection. And there is an entertainment value to that, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you go to, okay, so we're going to talk about one of my favorite things, which is demographic research, right? Um, if you go and take a look at webtoons, because webtoons is pretty much where all the web comics have gone at this point. Yeah. If you go take a look at the target demographic that's on there, it's all um, young women between the ages of fourteen and maybe twenty-two. I'm on there. I'm an outlier. Don't judge me. Um, but all of the comics that are super popular on there are the slice of life. They're the romances. They're also the ones where it's like I'm going to go back in time and do it again, right? Like an isekai, but it's not in a game setting. It's just like I'm going back. I'm doing the rebirth. Oh yeah, Mama Ward would know. So Mama Ward writes a lot of cozy mysteries as well. So yeah, she's good people. The biggest one in the fantasy genre that popped up in the last few years was oh shoot, I forgot its name. It's by uh, audiobook narrator Travis Baldry. Uh, gosh, oh uh, Legends and Lattes, and that one was self-published for about a minute, and then 
uh, either or a tour, I think picked it right up and I'm kind of curious. Popular. Yeah. I'm kind of, I'm interested in reading it. I listened to a little bit of the audio uh, sample and it sounded uh, well-written and it's got two of my favorite things in there, orcs and coffee. Uh, but at the same time, it's also a low stakes, cozy, sapphic lesbian romance novel. And I'm like, that's not exact. I'm not exactly the demographic for that kind of story, but I'm willing to give it a try and see if it's worth the hype. Cause my God, it gets pushed a lot. Like that's probably the big dog in the cozy fantasy genre right now, but there's others that have been popping up. It's probably got the marketing team behind it. I remember when it first came out as independent and a whole bunch of people like on booktube were talking about it. Oh yeah. Yeah. And the truth of the matter is that if you're, if you get enough attention, one of the publishers will come and try and talk to you about your book. Um, and then one one fun thing for anybody who might be considering traditional publishing is that 90% of their marketing budget goes to 1% of their author. So it's not, unfortunately, something that is across the board. But yes. if they can, yeah, if they find something that they're kind of like, yes, that's the thing that's going to that's gonna happen, then they are going to be pushing it in stores and they're going to be talking to Amazon to make sure it keeps showing up in search engines. Like I have, I, I kid you not, the only reason I keep seeing the Lattes book is because Amazon keeps sending it to me. I have never looked it up. I have never tried to find it outside of like their own website when they had it at the time. But, you know, the publishers have that deal with Amazon. So, and uh, for those of you who aren't aware, so way back when Kindle came out, you know, independent authors actually were very successful on there. And to the point where some of them were actually able to quit their jobs and were right full time. You know, they were having a great time. Like uh, Ash Hivemind was one of those those authors. And Living in the dream. Yeah, living the dream. Yeah. And what happened is in 2009, the big six at the time uh, went to Amazon and say, we're losing money because these indie authors are cutting into the Kindle sales that we have. Like, And they cut a deal where uh, what ended up happening is that whenever you do a search uh, for a book or anything like that, like werewolf romance or just pick whatever your SEO keywords you want are, the first 10 results are all going to come from one of the bigger publishers or one of their umbrella ones. Right. And then you start running into the independent authors. So one of my friends who was making like he said he was almost making twice as what he made a month writing than with his job that he had at the time. Um, and because they cut, he said he, almost overnight, like his royalties were so small, he couldn't even afford gas and he had to go back into baking. Right. Yeah. And it's it's even worse because like here's here's the thing with like Amazon. Amazon is a bully. I mean, you, you not I'm not the first one to say it, but they're a bully because what they would do, right, um, is that they would let us indie authors know it's like, hey, for you to be more competitive with these these bigger houses, you might have to cut down on your prices, right? And so us in our great effort to get our books into readers' hands and to be seen and be you know palatable, right? We don't want to suck, you know. We want to be the pumpkin spice latte that somebody wants to buy, right? Um, they would lower that price and then Amazon would go back to the houses and be kind of like, Hey, you know, I don't know what to tell you. Your books aren't getting sold because they just cost too much. Like you're going to have to lower your prices. And when publishing houses have to lower their prices, well, that money doesn't just come from anywhere, right? It comes from author royalties, which is why if you take a look at author royalties, those have gotten lower and lower to the point where a lot of people aren't getting them right now. So. And, and that's, uh, that's a, a good discussion to have. And, I'll get to it in just a second. Let me get to this uh, super chat I missed a little bit earlier. $2 from Timo Berman. Miles Morales is Miles Morales getting back on the uh, on the comic book train. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that I could do a whole stream about that, but uh, it, it is what it is. Um, where is that? Uh, I, I did want to highlight Storm Corey HQ, who is actually my good friend Anna Main, just got in for dinner. The fiancé, future in-laws. Yes, he just uh, got... Uh, Got a fiance in his life, and I couldn't be happier for my friend. So I just want to give a shout out to BDJD and his awesome guest. I'm not going to tell you what that means. I do know what it means, though. Okay. I uh, my friend Abomination AJ wants to know: Are you into werewolves or something? And no, we were most. I think we we're mostly just talking about you know the genres that are including uh, werewolves, like young adults and romance. Yeah, I mean, werewolves and vampires are super popular because they're usually written in a way that is meant to be a, uh, represent like some kind of form of human nature, right? So vampires are often used to represent addiction, 
right? Because they're always kind of like, you have to stop drinking the blood. Like, don't drink the blood. It's like, I got to drink it. Like, blah, 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 blah. Where werewolves tend to represent like that primal instinct, you know, are you just an animal or are you a man at the same time? Like, which one rules you, right? And right. those are always really fun. Uh, things yeah, to play with. AJ's got an affinity. For, he likes uh, he likes werewolves the same way I like orcs. So uh, that's one of his favorite uh, favorite fictional. That, that just means that you're both of men of culture and fine taste. That's what that means. Yes. Right, right. Barely constra barely constrained savagery. That's what we are, and uh, I wouldn't want it any other way. Um, back on the publisher issue real quick, like Iron Age Media right here about them picking up indie authors, trying to, that's, that is the very good point, trying to buy growth essentially. I did a video uh, last year called The Game Has Changed, and it still is evergreen. It is about the, and it, it, it started, kicked off because Star Wars author E.K. Johnston was complaining that her publisher was asking her to increase her me social media presence and like go on live streams and talk to the people to kind of help market herself. And she took umbrage to that because she felt that the publisher should be handling this marketing uh, aspect. And really, unless you're one of the Brandon Sanderson's or the Stephen King's or the Travis Baldry's of the world, they're not putting their focus on marketing on you. The smaller authors are kind of getting left in the dust. And a lot of them, she uh, ended up deleting it and blocking me because I pointed this out. Uh, didn't want to, she was one of the few that actually wanted to step up and admit it. And it wasn't a me too situation where everybody else started piling in. Like uh, she got kind of shunned for that. Because nobody else in that uh, in that sphere wants to admit that that is what's happening because they've got the prestige of being a published author. So, you know, they don't want to lose that their spot. And so naturally, they're not going to complain about where they're at. But it's absolutely what's happening mm -hmm. now here in the indie authors are building up really big fan bases with really good works and I think that's what they're doing. Uh, the publisher's uh, biggest moves are doing is uh finding indie authors who have big followings and then snatching them and up and trying to bring their fan base uh inside you are of them. you are absolutely correct and i can speak to that just a little tiny bit and i'm going to be throwing some shade out um there was a book that came out a little oh while girlfriend ago. i'm all here for it yeah you're here for it here for the tea you even got tea. Spill the tea <laughs> um there was a book that came out a while ago it was called zenith um i'm gonna tell you what this was the most terrible book i think i've ever read um but it was by two it was it was a co it was i can't remember it was a collab between two book booktubers right so two people who often talked about books here on the youtube channels right and um because they had like a combined um a combined uh fan base publishers took a look at that and they're kind of like instantly we know that we're going to make money off of that because their followers are going to want to support them and buy the book and everything I have never read. There's only one book that I read that was worse than this book. And that one was definitely an indie book. And it was worse for, for different reasons. But um, this book was so bad because first off, like plots would go in one direction, then it would disappear. And then suddenly another plot would appear. And then characters would be kind of like, uh, you know, I can't wait for all these people to die and then be alone in the room being like, I can't believe all these people are dead. Like, you know, it was like, you, like, are you bipolar? Like what's going on? Right. And initially, when people were talking about Zenith, they were having the discussion of like, uh, why is this book so bad? Where some individuals like myself came out was like, why did the publisher use these two girls to, to basically put this book out and prove to us that they don't care about writing, they just care about sales? I mean, I told you earlier, it's like, you know, you have to want to make money, but there's a difference between wanting to make money and wanting to be a, a used car salesman, right? So... And um, one thing that I will let you know is that in publishing houses, they have three kinds of edits, right? They got the, you got to fix this edit. Like they're like, it's got like the deep scrub going in there, fixing everything, right? It's got the light edit and it's just kind of like, hey, go in there and fix the, the big problem children and do the grammar and stuff like that. And then you got the third edit, which is like, just make sure that, you know, people can read it, right? That book got the third edit because there's no way a developmental editor looked at it. There's no way that, um, copy editor looked at because there were some sentences where I was like this is a fragment and this is incorrect and like this is a rip and there's so many word echoes and like what is happening right now right Ugh. but yeah no it, they will do that that in fact um one conversation that I had with somebody a couple of years ago 
Uh, so like back in the early 2000s, if you were an author and had your website, that was like revolutionary, right? It was like, oh my goodness, people can find you on the internet. What a novel idea. Um, but now, now when you go to a publisher, one of the things that the publisher and the agents will ask you um, is they're going to ask you what your social media presence is. They're going to ask where they can find you. They're going to ask you what you're willing to do for outbound marketing, right? So before when they used to do the outbound marketing, now they're pushing it on to you. And you have to pay for those tickets to go to those book signing conventions. You have to buy your own bookmarks, your own postcards. You have to do it all yourself, right? Um, and it was like, and then it was to a point last time I talked to an agent where they said, they're asking for your previous sales info, right? What was your sales details? And I was like, if you're an indie, like if you are a new author, right? you're not going to have any previous sales info to give because you've never published anything before, which means to me that they weren't looking for anybody who had actually been published before. They were looking for sure deals because publishing right now, the traditional houses are in a place where they can't afford to take risks. Go into a bookstore, right? Go look at those center tables. What books are there? I guarantee you it is the books that have been selling nonstop for the last 30 years, Harry Potter, Shakespeare, classics, all that stuff. Maybe you'll find something out there from like Michelle Obama or something like that. But it's the books that they know that people are going to buy no matter what. So, all right, that was my. And so these fun. days, their these days their latest tactic is the banned book, which is nothing more than an unscrupulous marketing tactic for books that are been sitting on the shelf, uh, been sitting on their shelves, or been sitting in the warehouses for a lot of these publishers, and they're just trying to push them out there as quote unquote banned. Uh, that is such a that is such a, a and so many people buy it hook line and sinker because they want to believe that there's somebody out there that doesn't want kids to read this book or that book. Like, look, you can't put every book uh, ever just because some some school in the middle of bumfuck nowhere takes their copy of uh, Huckberry Finn off of the shelf and give put something else in there doesn't mean Huck Finn is banned. But they want to believe that uh, the people who are doing it are as bad as they believe they are. So uh, then you get banned books that are not banned. You can buy them pretty much anywhere. And yeah, banned books is branding. Yeah. It's it's another marketing tactic. And you know, if you're smart enough, you can see through it. Uh, you have a question. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say Mama Word was asking questions, so I didn't want her to be ignored. Uh, how do you feel about the divide in indie authors between those who just want to share a story and those who want to be a famous author someday? I guess that depends on like the intention, because if you just want to write a story and just have one person read it, I mean, there's Wattpad, right? Um, but at the same time, famous author, um, I don't know what famous is anymore, if that right. makes any sense. Because I've met the people who think that they're going to no go on the night talk shows and stuff like that. And that's not really um, a thing anymore, especially since talk shows aren't really a thing either. Uh, they're there, but like who goes on there and, and you know, for a, a book tour, unless it's a celebrity. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's all that's all a late night talk show is. Once you get past the poorly written monologue, it's a celebrity infomercial. And it used to be back in the back in the old days. With Johnny Carson and you know Jay Leno and David Letterman, they used to have people on because they thought they were interesting, and you know celebrities used to be interesting, used to be interesting. Now I wish I knew a lot less about them. Or sometimes they just have someone who just seemed like uh, uh, they had some peculiar, interesting you know, take on life, and people tune in for it. But it's a dead format, you know. It's it's every celebrity that comes on there has a new show, a new book, a new play, a new something. And, you know, they're just chilling their stuff. They're not there for a genuine conversation. That's all, all it is. And it's been that way for a long, long time. And back in the day, it used to be funny enough to warrant watching, but it's not even that anymore. So uh, really, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Snow is right. Late night talk shows are old people sleep cues. It, it is. Nobody's staying up till twelve uh, till past midnight on a weekday to watch Seth Meyers. Nope. <clears throat> nope. And uh, there was one back. There was one. Uh, I, 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 I kind of agree. And my answer to this is: How do you feel about the divide? I just want to share a story. Yeah. Um, if you actually want more people to see your story, like Wattpad's fine. Royal Road is fine. 
Um, and you can actually workshop your story a little bit there. But if you really want to step up to the stage and create value for what you write, you know, and so either you make it and add yourself to the slush pile at the editor's table of the big trade corporations, which may sit there until it rots uh, on top of the desk, or you can go the self-publishing route, which uh, has managed to generate a way to, for you. To, it's people, the quality has shaken out in self-publishing. Yes, there's a lot there to sift through, but the people that know how to make it work, who know how to make covers that are eye grabbing mm -hmm. and, you know, synopsises that, you know, bring you in. Uh, and especially a lot of, uh, I call them the uh, box set authors. They write three books at once, edit them all together and then release them one month, two months, three months apart. Mm -hmm. So yeah. very rapidly. And then after that, what do they have? They have a box set mm -hmm. and they can occasionally every so often put that on sale. Hey, three books for uh, three, five books for one buck. Right. Mm hmm. Like that's a, that's a smart strategy. And for some it works and some it don't. Uh, I try and tell, and I've, I've got an indie author friend, I'm not going to name him, who uh, wrote his first book and every now and then just agonizes that, you know, I, nobody cares about my book. I No, dude, no. All the people who are going to buy that first book are have already bought it and read it. What's the next book? What's coming in next? You know, what is the next book that you're producing? And it's a continued body of work, a new book that is going to get people interested in your body of uh, work. And they may go back. And now that first book, your first book is basically selling your third book because mm -hmm. you've got you. You just come out with your third book. Hey, give you a code. Uh, give you a code for my first book free just to you know try and bring you into the series. Mm -hmm. And the people that are really trying to push forward to be famous with it. You really got to stand out. You really got to do something special to do that. Mark my words. You will hear the name Ryan Cahill or Cahill in the future. He is essentially the Brandon Sanderson, the Godzilla of indie fantasy right now. And I, I've not come across anybody that hates his work. And he is getting that kind of following. At some point, it's uh, he's going to end up being traditionally published. So uh, going down here. Uh, now you did write one particular, uh, novel mention I was on here and this was kind of, uh, kind of a bit of a nerdy romance novel. Can you tell us oh, yeah. uh, about this one? Roll D20. Yeah. Love? Yeah. So roll D20 for love. Um, I have to give you more backstory. So, um, uh, at the end of 2020, terrible year. Uh, wildest year that we've ever had. I uh, moved from Arizona to Florida, and it was it, it was a traumatic move. And I I have a whole video about it if you guys want to go watch the the video of my my terrible move. Um, but at one point, I was I was so disheartened to write or do anything else. And I was also, if you guys remember from earlier, I was uh, with the first publisher, or not the first, but like the publisher that I'm not allowed to speak about. Like that stuff was like really ramping up into something not very fun and I was not sure what I was going to do about it. it was really kind of killing my my will to write books and um I think so it was on uh writer's workshop writer's workshop is um is a book club that is hosted by Tamara Woods and it's basically where authors if you guys are not aware authors are notorious for picking up books about how to do writing craft like we have so many like and she wanted us to actually have the books and read them and discuss them so one of the books that we ended up getting was how to write a book in seven days right and so that was actually where the hashtag seven day book challenge came from and so I read it and at one point I was like, let's do it. Like, let's put this to the test. Let's see if we can actually take what works for this author and see if it works for us. Because as you guys know, methods vary for one person to another person. So we're like, let's, let's do it. We'll do a, a group collective study. And um, so the moment I had that idea, I had the idea for like this book. And as you guys know, I am, you know, I'm involved with like comics and stuff like that. And I, my thought was like, what would happen if an industry artist ended up getting together with like, you know, a comic book shop owner who was like a grumpy bear, right? Like that was my thought. 
Um, and so like the moment that I, I had that thought, like this story, like literally just came to life after almost not writing for a year and 70,000 words hammered that out. I love this story so much. Um, and it's, it's probably my favorite book that I've written so far. So, but that's, that's the story of how it came to be. And there's a little bit of commentary in there about what's kind of going on in the comic and, and comic book shop industries right now. I, I, I kind of sprinkle it in there, but don't go too deep into it because, um, the thing about when you write romances is that the women who read them don't really want you to dive into the nitty gritty. They just want enough for flavor and tension. Um, but they're there, they're there to just watch the two people get together. So, but yes, this was. I, I noticed that one time um, I had somebody that I worked with that noticed saw me reading a book and they were like, hey, would you, uh, you ought to try this. You'd like, you like her. But, and I, I'm probably mispronouncing this. Sherilyn Kenyon. Uh, she's very prolific. She's got a lot of work out there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I borrowed the book that she gave me and it was a sci-fi romance book. And, and it wasn't my, much my bag, but I, what you said is true like the romance aspect was the front and center of the narrative the world building for the universe they were in was very much on the back burner when you get the flip side to that in a lot of you know male written uh genre novels usually the romance is always a subplot of some sort yeah so that was an interesting dynamic that i noticed when i read that and i was like okay so and this is why i say it's uh it's important to read outside your genre because you never know what you might pick up or what you might learn or uh, what you might, you know, come across that you can use in your own writing. Mm -hmm. uh, are you a, a player of Dungeons and Dragons? Uh, Cause I know you I got am. some nerdy hobbies. <laughs> I am. Yes. I, uh, I actually uh, downstairs, <laughs> I, I have a uh, hope. I know he's watching this. I have not given up this hope, my love of, of having the gaming table down there. So like a, almost like a poker table that we can like roll dice on and have like maps on. And I've got all these figures and tons of dice. I don't play in person D and D these days, but maybe, maybe I'll make more friends and we'll all come over and have nerd night. Like we used to do before 2020. So, but yeah, I, uh, there's one online campaign that I'm doing right now and I absolutely love it because I am playing, um, a plague doctor orc. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun for me. I love him already. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. I love him. Already. What class is he? Uh, plague doctor falls under the wizard class. Oh, okay, okay. I had a I had a plague doctor necromancer that I played, and uh, that was I always like. Uh, and, and that was kind of the impetus for a lot of characters that I created for my book. Right? They were all like an attempt to be a very unique kind of D and D character. I have a half orc who's higher in intelligence, but not you know uh, not so much in the uh, strength department. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a a half goblin, half elf, who's a blacksmith, and her sister, a half orc, half goblin, who's a bar basically a fighter barbarian. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so uh, a lot of that ends up becoming, uh, you know, fuel for my stories. I come up with these characters. One of my favorite character I created, I haven't brought into my books, is uh, my swamp druid Hagatha, and uh, I always who is this little goblin druid who vomits Spanish moss uh, using uh, druid craft just for the giggles of it a lot of fun at the table uh i i love dungeons and dragons myself how did you how did you get uh involved in playing that because i come from a time because i'm of a certain vintage where uh girls playing the nerdy things was not necessarily uh uh not necessarily you guys were as rare as diamonds right mm -hmm. except for rh snow who was the queen of nerdum she was there when it was first released she's an og nerd i um i'll be honest my husband was cute that's how i got into it <laughs> yep so now i played a little bit of it before but i think when my husband um so my husband and i both met when we were in the military and he ended up being gm for um one of my campaigns and up until then, uh, we were switching systems. So that didn't help me trying to figure out. So we would be like D&D &D second edition. Then it would be Shadowrun and then GURPS. And I was just like, there's so many numbers and I don't know what they mean. Somebody just tell me what this, this does when I roll it, right? Right. Um, and, but my husband at one point was like, okay, so let's just take a look at your character sheet and we're going to like help you out, figure this out a little bit. Uh, and he he's always like, 
my husband is a wonderful man in that he doesn't like let me be less than my very best. So if he sees that I'm not using all my abilities or something, he's going to be like, you could do this. Like these are things that you could do. So he's always like coaching me and trying to help me when it comes to like D&D and all of that. So, but yeah, no, my husband was cute. That's how I got into it. And uh, I've never stopped. <laughs> And that's what we end up doing is, as uh, couples, right? Like my wife and I are very similar in that respect in that a lot of, uh, this is a true story. You know what? This is all, that's almost identical to something my wife did when we started dating, where she found out that I played video games. This is in the late nineties. And what did she do? She went out with her own money and bought a PlayStation one and like four games so that, I would have, you know, we could play games together when I come visit her at her house. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was very sweet of her. And I, I think I still have one of those games to this day. Um, and it was just, it, it was just one of them little things that kind of told me, I think she might be a keeper. And I think we're going on 20 years now oh, nice. uh, that we've been, uh, we've been married 24 just together. Uh, got a $2 super chat from Iron Age Media. What's your favorite war game, favorite tabletop RPG? Bolt Action. So Bolt Action is like a historical uh, reenactment of battles that happened over time. So that's probably my favorite. Uh, but my favorite tabletop RPG would probably still be Shadowrun. I love Shadowrun. So especially if I can play like a Fizz Adept, like That's, yeah. But I don't just play any kind of Fizz, fizz Adept. I always play the one where I put my points into like, you know, against organic matter. Right. Um, but I don't do it for anything else. So I, I would always play characters that were really good at like punching through people like they were butter, but then I'd break my toe on a rock. Right. Like it was worth it. Life. It was always so good. <laughs> Life is like that sometimes. Um, for me, I, I haven't played a lot of war. I, I don't think I've ever played a, a war game. And like those require like big tables and I only have so much space at my house. And uh I, I know a lot about Warhammer 40K, but all the knowledge that I ha I know about Warhammer 40K, I learned against my will. They uh, simplified it this year. I was real. I don't even play Warhammer, but they simplified it to the point where I was like, I'm leaving. I'm yeah. gone. Bye. Right. I I got very. It, I, the only thing I ever hear about Warhammer 40K is that it is the lore stuff and the stories and people th throwing memes at each other. I have yet to hear anyone talk about playing a great game of Warhammer. <laughs> I never hear anyone talk about the actual game. I used to watch them because um, when I would go and play bolt action, um, you know, there would be one row of tables for the bolt action people. And then the Warhammer folks would have the other ones. Um, and they all have like their various like complications to it. But like one guy had this like down, like he had figured it out because part of, um, you know what makes them different is like the, the structure of like the figures and stuff like that so he figured out how to put like little magnets um in the shoulder sockets so he could switch them out and not have to buy like 15 million of them all right um but it it almost and that's about the extent that i know it is um but for them to have like one turn i used to watch it would take anywhere between like five and ten minutes so yeah i think the only thing that's slower is possibly uh, battle tech i heard Battletech can take like a, a several hour session to cover 30 seconds of battle. Like what? Mm -hmm. Like that's crazy. Um, it, yes, this is, I, I think just part of the Warhammer culture is just the figuring painting and army building and things like that. I took one look at the figure prices and I'm like, no, I am a dirt poor DM. I make do with a lot, uh, a little, I can turn a little into a lot. And to me, it's always fun. Like, Got a little D and D thing right there. I do like the crafts part uh, part of it though, because uh, especially with D and D, me and the kids will get around the table and we'll have like a little arts and crafts day while I'm painting figures. Uh, a lot of times we end up using like these little uh, paper stands. Mm -hmm. That's big. Like uh, I've always been kind of a crafty guy. This is one. Of, this is like a uh, little treasure pile, treasure token that I made uh, for my oh, kids. Oh, I love that. Games. Yeah, that's that was a lot of fun. Uh, that's just and that's just like gold uh gold flakes in glitter and little uh little gemstones from the jewelry section and this mm -hmm. is a shield that was like a shield and a sword that can't fell off of a figure so i put them to use in that um like making my own tiles that was that was a big part of it and i haven't done that in a while because ever since i moved with the book it's all 
there's so much going on. I haven't had the time to sit down and do it much. Uh, Iron Age Media with $2. Never played a war game. I'm refunding both of these. I'm sorry, <gasps> Matt. Look, I only started playing Dungeons & Dragons in 2019, 2018. Right? I'm a bit of a late bloomer to tabletop role-playing game. It's, it's fun, but... You know, finding people around me who actually share that interest took a long time to find, right? Like, that's the mm -hmm. biggest part of it. And it's the most fun in person, but getting a group together that can consistently come together is uh, a little on the difficult side. Yeah, that coordination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is because we all have lives and we all have stuff going on. And so uh, it, it is what it is. But so. Well, Carol, uh, we're probably going to be wrapping this up uh, okay. right, very shortly. Um, I'm recovering from a day of fence building and got some work going on tomorrow. Spent a little time with the family. But I wanted to thank you very much uh, for dropping in this evening. Guys, if you got any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat now before we uh, before we leave. So uh, what's uh, can you what, what can you can you give us a little inside tea on what's next possibly for the Ripiverse? Oh, well, you know, Alpha Core might be coming out. Sorry. <laughs> no, can't can't give us a date, though, huh? Oh, we oh, so the reason we don't have a date yet um, is because we're just waiting for the rest of the merchandise to come in because we don't really like to launch until everything's in the warehouse. So that's, I can understand. That's, yeah, so that's normally what holds us up. Um, and so we're just waiting for all of that to come in. Uh, I do know... I don't know when Mike's book is coming out yet, um, just because that's in production. Obviously, Yara is is in the works. Uh, who, what can I talk about? Because it's like, you know, that whole like NDA thing. Um, and and look, I, I'm uh, I'm anxious for uh, I'm anxious for Alpha Core, too. Uh, Eric has this habit and I, I'm pretty sure this is uh, intentional and personal on his part against me. He always drops a campaign when I'm between checks. And so I have to wait until I get paid in order to uh, launch it. So that's why I ended up uh, taking me like three times as longer to uh, do get my review and live stream out there uh, because I got it later than everybody else did. Eric, please um, I don't, don't do that. <laughs> I can't say he does it on purpose. It's really like once we know that everything's like super green, then it's like go, go, go. Right. So that's that's really what it is. So but may I know like as we go forward, we'll have like a more like streamlined like production schedule of when stuff will come out. But yeah. So. A couple late questions. Tim O'Brien wants to know how you type twice as fast as him. Well, I outline and I uh, <laughs> put no, the pants here in his place. <laughs> no my regular typing speed is like 90 words a minute so it also depends on how fast you type if you're not a fast typer i would recommend um just working on that and then the other thing is um when i when i write i have the spell check and the grammar check turned off because i'm the kind of person that if i see the squiggly line i will stop and go fix it which ends up like slowing me down so uh, that's part of how I do it. I don't let that stuff hold me up. And I mean, you're going to uh, edit it later. So just do it at the end. But that's how I write twice as fast as you. I outline and all those things. Uh, all right. Snow wants to know what your favorite part of your new house is. Oh, man. Um, I have a gigantic walk-in closet. And I'm saying that with like a questioning tone of voice because... When they told me I had a walk-in closet, I literally thought it was just like open the door and then there would be like, you know, hangers and stuff. This walk-in closet is its own bedroom. Like it is so big. You can put a twin bed in there. And I was so confused about why a closet would be that huge. And the only reason it is my favorite is because when strangers are in the house, I actually have a place to put the dogs. So that's that's why it's my that's favorite. That's good. Yeah. I, is it going to end up becoming a closet or are you going to turn it into like your own YouTube studio? Um, you know, I thought about it because actually, so in this room, you can't see this one. This closet is also huge. It's ginormous as well. Um, and I thought about just putting, um, I thought about just putting like all my computer stuff in there to reduce room echo, because that's one of the things that happens when you're in podcasts and stuff like that. Um, but it's, this room doesn't have an air vent or anything. So like if these computers were in there, it would overheat and I'd be like sweating like crazy. So oh, yeah, there is room that in there for that problem. too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we, there's actually a space allocated just for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
That sounds good. And and we say move because for those who don't know, you ended up having to move uh, to work with the Ripaverse, didn't you? Yeah. So that was kind of funny because Eric called me and he was kind of like, hey, you know, I, I would really, you know, it's, it's time. I need you to be like on site because I was in Florida, not in Dallas, Texas. And I said, OK. Um, and then what was really funny is the next time the next time I talked to him, I was like, hey, I'm going to have to take three days off next week because I'm going to be driving all my stuff to, to Dallas. And he was like, wait, you're moving already? I was like, yeah, I'm going to see you on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> that was quick. Yeah. I mean, was it a was it a bad move? No, it was actually really good. I mean, um, that last move was terrible for reasons that are in the video. Not that I'm trying to make you all go watch my terrible video, but um, we knew kind of, you know, what we wanted to do and how we wanted to do it. And um, we did a little bit more research about who to get to help us with that process. And probably the the nice thing about it is that we were able to like get rid of some stuff where it was like we don't need this, we don't want to put it in the box and carry it, so it's gone. So that was that was nice. Yeah, you're yeah. uh, you are you are now neighbors with RH Snow. There's a there's a lot of uh, folks in the Iron Age over in Texas. Texas, yeah. Texas, uh, AJ and Ego are over there. Snow's there. I think Richard's there, and uh, I'm right next door, literally. Uh, we got the better food, though. We kept it all for ourselves. Oh. No Cajun culture for you Texans, unless you oh. ask nicely. But y'all still invited to the crawfish boil. We got we got barbecue, though. I found the barbecue out here. It is so good. I have not had barbecue this good, like, ever. I'll, I'll grant that. The barbecue is pretty awesome. Last time I was in Houston, I stopped and got some. And it was like, uh, it was it, it, even even just a mid-tier barbecue place, but it was still amazing. Texas. The Iron Age. Sorry, <laughs> sorry about that, Daniel. But uh, you'll have to uh, deal with where you're at. Poor Royce is up in the middle of nowhere, and he's got—I don't think he's got any great food where he's at. I, I can't remember what he's in, in Idaho or, or not Idaho. Well, whatever. He's up there in the near the Pacific Northwest, and no Cajun food, no bar, no good barbecue. That's probably why he built that smoker. <laughs> Um, yeah, we don't want to start any barbecue fights. No, no, guys, because uh, then you get everybody. <laughs> no, but nothing, nothing gets people riled up like, oh, my, you know, whose barbecue is better? At the very least here in Cajun country, we know whose Cajun food is the best. But Mama oh. Ward can testify. I got into a 30 minute discussion with somebody about tacos once because I was like, no, those are crap tacos. Like you should not eat those, you know, and they're, you know, it went on forever. So that's the joke about yeah. 30 minute tacos. Yeah, Tex-Mex is I always consider Tex-Mex very different from you know, like authentic Mexican food. I, I like Tex-Mex better anyway, but uh, be that as it may, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring everything to a close this evening. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, being here this evening. It was great talking to you, and uh, let me know when the new book launches in November. Oh, well, yes. So I will, we will, I will see send you a DM. I will let you know for sure. Sweet. And everyone else, thank you all for showing up. Thank you to everybody that dropped by the Rumble stream to kind of help us out over there, to help us grow where we can. Thank you to everybody. <laughs> uh, thank you to everybody for uh, hanging out with us and doing some author and Ripaverse talking. Uh, this has been a fun uh, discussion. Who suck? Oh, oh, come on, AJ. No, no, we're not getting, we're not getting into that. We're not getting into that. Tennessee barbecue? No, we're not getting into that. No, we're not. We're not doing this that. This is a great time to end the stream. Quick. This is a, the perfect time to end the stream. Thank you guys for showing up. Uh, it is, uh, and thank you for everybody, all the super chatters and everything. Hopefully, I can get. I'm all set up now to get the payouts for monetization. So uh, your money will actually go in my pocket and go to future books. So, uh, thank you to Carol Brown for being here. I am author John A. Douglas, and hail the Iron Age. Hail.